doing other things before theater especially is good for the art. Like the most real world experience gives you the most in to what a lot of these plays are trying to, plays, musicals, artwork itself are trying to get into. And all that helps. I mean, everybody has, a, you know, a, a robust and diverse background, but like the more input I felt like I could get, the more I felt like I could reach these specific works, especially, you know. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome to Was It Chance, the podcast about embracing opportunity and taking intentional risk for your creative life. I'm Heather Vickery. And I'm Alan Seals. And Heather and I started off as two perfect strangers who met by chance and embraced opportunity. Listen in as we chat with other successful people about the risks they've taken to put themselves on a path to creative success. Alan, I'm excited about today's guest. Can you tell everybody who's here with us? Can I? I wrote the bio. I would love to. Can, can I? Would you please? Would I please? Okay. <laughs> Did so you just correct guest, my grammar? No, sorry. Our guest today is Nicholas Hassong, who is an artist, designer, and creative producer who was recently nominated for a Tony Award for Best Woo-woo. Scenic Design of a Play for his work as a projection designer on the recent Broadway production of Skeleton Crew. He's a graduate of Yale School of Drama, among many other things. He's got a long list of credits designed for live performance designing for live performances both (laughs) on and off Broadway. Words are hard. He has worked as a creative programmer for Mark Jacobs, director of design for Smith and Westward, is the co-creator of Feast, an immersive designing experience with Listen and Breathe, and is also an adjunct professor at the New School in New York and at USC in Los Angeles, California. Nicholas, holy crap, man. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. (laughs) Thank you. It's good to be here. Yeah, look at you, double double coast oh, yeah. by coastal. Coast. That's a pandemic thing that happened. It was just like really? one that ha- yeah. we're 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 jumping in way ahead of where we normally start. But how does that happen during the pandemic? Well, oh, because it's virtual. Yeah, yeah, because I was doing uh, all live <laughs> performance before the pandemic, and then it stopped. <laughs> and I was doing some Zoom theater, like I think many people were, and. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm was like, oh, I think I'm ready for a change. And there had been an opportunity in television for a while from this writer, Rollin Jones, that I'd worked with like right out of grad school, uh, who had been trying to get me to come to LA and try that out. And it seemed like a great time. We wanted some sun. We wanted to see the other coast and see how that would work. So we moved and lived there wow. until roughly now, you know, the beginning of this year. And then now we're trying to do the bicoastal thing. Wait, wait, wait. So it was when when physical theater shut down and everyone quarantined you moved you moved to be a to be a physical teacher on another coast i did i did well i moved i i initially moved to work in podcasting actually and television oh um for this street or for this uh, company called dwight street book club they had just recently gotten picked up by amc to write and create interview with a vampire So I moved out there to help them and just be like an artist, dramaturg, help them with basically whatever they need, some graphic things, um, help them launch some podcast. Uh, And then through some friends that I have out there, they're like, hey, why don't you come teach at USC? So I did. Okay. There's so much chance embracing that has happened along that last couple sentences. So the, the creative design for podcasting, I want to dive into this because I, I know my own experience, our experience with, you know, creating logos and making a website <laughs> and whatever the case is when it comes to uh, the design work of a podcast. But for a medium that's mostly pretty much audio driven, uh, what is your role? What was your role in the podcasting space? Yeah, so, uh, it, you know, it was a slow role when I went out there. We didn't really know exactly what I was going to do. I, they knew that they wanted some dramaturgical help with the television stuff, though there was also many other great people working on that. Uh, I was there to help them think about it visually and storytelling. And so they're just excited to have me. They already had a a very successful podcast called Ask Rana that I got involved with because they wanted to do a um, Mm. rebranding for Instagram, mostly at that time. They also have a coffee that they sell. So I was helping with that. (laughs) Podcast coffee. Why don't we have a podcast coffee? It's actually quite (laughs) successful. So I would suggest, you know, like the subscribers (laughs) help make the podcast possible. Uh, you know, as well Wait, as like was it chance 
the coffee, the podcast, the coffee. Got it. All right, cool. Uh-huh. Go on. <laughs> uh-huh. Exactly. I can see it already. Um, and then we just kept trying new things. Like it's, it's an advice podcast. It um, also has this lifestyle element. So I helped them generate more revenue and more people. And what the audience was excited about was, you know, the Instagram for one and what new things we could present to them. And then I just sort of got involved in the producing side and we started doing, you know, virtual live shows and, you know, trying to build out this quote unquote universe for this podcast. And now we're trying to develop our own network of things. So it's like, so we can build oh. off the success of Ask Rana and bring in other podcasts to try and create, you know, Alan loves the word network. I do. I do. <laughs> so his whole face, like, wait, we need to talk later. I yeah, still want to go down. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, Nicholas, we often interview people who are very forward facing in creative arts. And it's really fun to be able to talk with you because your work is forward facing, but you are. I mean, Drew Gasparini said that, like, the most famous person you've never heard of kind of thing. Um, what led you into the, it's so creative, but also, I, you know, I, I don't do this type of work, but I imagine there's so much collaboration and cooperation required. You very rarely, I assume, just get to design and create. So what led you to this and what do you love about it? Yeah, I mean, I think what you're saying is right. I mean, I think it was the collaboration that really brought me here and more specifically the people. Like uh, mm-hmm. I thought for a long time about being a studio artist. Um, I've had many people encourage me and want to give me funding to do sort of things on my own that I would sort of be the the face of this thing. And it's interesting to me to try as like a, as like a um, mental exercise but I think I'm most excited about pushing a story or an idea or uh, a thing, you know, even if it's not either of those things forward. And it's important to me to be surrounded with people that, you know, I really do think that more minds are better than one. I mean, I, there's always mm. the point of the spirit, like there needs to be someone leading us. But like sure. yeah. the the people and the conversations, I think, can have a richer outcome if we just let that space exist and if i'm completely honest i never really wanted to be in the forefront i sort of like in the background because i feel like i have more room to for me personally think and and create and help see what we're trying to do from a different angle i love that it reminds me of this is gonna sound like a random segue but bear with me for a second abby wambach's book wolfpack there's this moment where she talks about whenever she would score a goal, she would immediately do the dance and point where she would point at the coach who got her there or the person who made the pass or whatever, because you don't score a goal without everybody else involved mm. in getting you to that point. And I just, I can see you getting those points, right? <laughs> like yeah. we could not have done this without your incredible, incredible creative work. Who was the first person that, that, led you down the path that you're on now to that point right who was the yeah. first coach the first pass that what was the first pass you got as young nikki to be like <laughs> i'm gonna start drawing or designing or projecting yeah i mean i didn't know what i wanted to do i mean still to this day i mean look i live on two coasts i do many different things which is exciting <laughs> to me probably like my just risk you know excitement like you know they talk about risk averse people i sort of like Let's try it. Let's do this thing. Let's see what happens. Um, mostly it's worked out okay. Sometimes it's, you know, a little dicey there for a little bit. But I would say I didn't know what I want to do, especially in undergrad. Uh, and then I just took a theater class on a whim. And that professor, Kip Schroger, just like, was like, oh, no, try harder. Do focus this. Look, it can be all these different things. Like, think about this. You know, just sort of opened my mind up in a way that I had never really thought I could. And this, you know, I, I mean, I'm very proud of my undergrad, which is Ball State in Indiana. Oh, hey, that's where my whole family is from, Muncie. <laughs> really? That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I lived there in Muncie for four years and had a great time. But I wouldn't necessarily call it like a um, art school, like, you know, talking yeah. eventually where it's I... a nursing school. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, most of my friends were trying to be nurses or like yeah. some sort of political science situation. 
Um, mm -hmm. But, it, you know, it was just enough of, of a push in a direction that then I could, after grad school, like, sort of explored around and tried to find that next thing to sort of, you know, feed that longing for community in the sense of like that collaboration, like we were talking about, like, what are these conversations that can help push this story or whatever forward? What I love about that, though, is it's just this reminder that you don't actually have to have a specific degree in something to be really successful in it. You have to have an interest and some skill and some talent and I mean, hopefully some talent. <laughs> I mean, I think it's I think resilience, I think resilience, yeah. resilience, I think is a big part of it. I mean, I tell my students a lot that it's especially my undergrad students, it's like, just get that receipt. You know what I mean? Yes. You just got to get that first degree. Just try as many things as you want. If you're getting a degree, that's totally cool. But just get the receipt. Then you have your whole life to figure other things out, especially if it's theater or, you know, in the arts in general, like there's there's many paths to what you want to go. And you are your own definition of success. Like, you know, the, the world will tell you one thing or you will think it's one thing. But then a few years later, it might be like, oh, no, this is actually interesting to me. Maybe I want to just work abroad or work on this tiny little project that brings me joy and can provide for my life. I, I guess that's sort of the philosophy that I that I go by as well in, in like I was sort of the same way. I got a computer science degree and then with that degree, that receipt, I started being a professional actor. So I always had that and then when applying, like it's nice to have that receipt, like you said, to be able to say like, yeah, I went through this and during that whole process, you meet your your support structure you meet your friends mm -hmm. you meet your opportunities that are going to allow you to move forward and decide what you do and more importantly what you do not want to do because when you can check off what you don't want to do it's going to leave a it's going to help you decide further on you know what you do like a and i sort of want to segue that into uh, a skeleton crew for a second because i i feel like if just from my own uh, I guess awareness of the technology talking specifically about projections in theater. I never really noticed that until whenever frozen opened on Broadway Sure. and the whole, the whole disappointment of like, wait, they didn't actually build a, like they relied on projections. They didn't build an actual ice castle. Like, exactly. Screw you, screw just you Disney. just super harsh. <laughs> exactly. on that your was the career. biggest criticism of one, one of the big ones. Well, yeah, they, anyway. there was a couple, but yeah, that was one. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was one of the big ones. <laughs> anyway, not saying the projections are bad. I'm saying in that show, it was they relied on it too heavily. But my point being, that was when I started noticing projections. So when you were in school for design work at a school that wasn't particularly a theater school, uh, I guess where where did where did you or how did you fall into projections? Because I, I'm involved. And in was the, it chance? And was it chance? <laughs> because I don't understand how you even start with that. Like that's a niche within a niche within a niche. Yeah, I mean at, at Ball State, there there we had a projector, but we didn't really use it very often because they didn't. You know what I mean? Like it 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 wasn't as. I mean, it certainly existed in the world, but it wasn't in our stratosphere there. So I graduated with the scenic design. I left, I did some technical work. I moved to North Carolina. Uh, I became the artistic associate there. And then they were like, okay, we're going to do this glass menagerie, but Tom's not going to have a typewriter. He's going to have a camera. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. And they were like, well, you're going to do the camera. Work. <laughs> like you're going to like figure out how to make it work. And then we were like, so that oh. you could see what was in his camera. Exactly, exactly. So oh, that's like, cool. so like they were staging. Really cool. I want to see that show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it was. I'm very proud. It was like the one that I was like, oh, this is what I should do, and it was totally, totally chance. Because then we started getting into it, and we were like, oh, so this is what Tom sees, you know. So we're having what you know Tennessee Williams wrote on stage, and then we're trying to get the subtext of what he wrote, you know, through Tom's eyes of what he sees. And so then we did these film things as well. That's like a little bit deeper into it. Uh, and we just did it on PowerPoint and I plugged it right into a projector, like the as simplest idea as possible. And that was it. But then I was hooked because it was, you know, all the planning of a scenic designer or a director, but all the versatility of a director or lighting designer in tech. So we could plan it out and like film these things. But once we were there, I could respond to the actors in the room and what we're discovering in the space or in the rehearsal hall in a way that was more freeing than just like, 
you know, setting up for success like a singing center does, which is so important of creating that foundation. But I also enjoyed being able to keep being versatile throughout the process. What is the process of designing a projection for to, to fit exact spaces on, on a scene? Like what, how, how do you go through the math, right? Of saying, all right, so we're, we have a five foot wide proscenium, which equates to 3.62 millimeters on the screen. Here. Like how does you that just all said work? It. You just said it basically. So, you know, we get, <laughs> we get drawings and we make pretty good estimates based off of how big the projectable amount is like the raster of it. So like the full amount able to project. And then we can, you know, do the math. We could turn the feet or meters into pixels. And then it'll tell us how big the screen or pixel or surface should be. That is so interesting. So then the the actual projections, the okay, so there's a projector at the back of the house, mm -hmm. projecting on the set. And how do you add how do you add tracking? Because I've seen some things where I forget what it what it was. Maybe it was the opening of Pippin. I actually forget what it was. Something on Broadway like years ago, where the guy had his hand open and there was a a little a shadow of a bird that was projected. And wherever he moved his hand, the bird followed. Uh, is what's the tech behind projection tracking? Is that something different, or is that all related? It, oh no, it's certainly a part of it. And I would say that there's like a a financial scale of complexity. <laughs> of course, yeah, the yeah. cheapest being because if the bird's gonna follow you around, that's gonna cost you a lot of money. It, it is. Yeah. We'll say that's the Pip and Broadway version. But if we bring it all the way back down, <laughs> I would say most of the time it's faked. Like the choreography is just so tight that you can't tell. The next yeah. step is. Um, is like a little encoder, which is basically like a mouse following a piece of tape that knows exactly where it is. So it can follow like a panel around. And then you step up one more and then you have like diodes and cameras that follow it along. And then you step up one more, which is like XR, which is like the new fancy thing, which means that there's a giant LED wall behind you and it can track yeah. based off of where the human is and where these little diodes, like it maps the whole space you know, this black track idea is the brand and it can like just see where everything is and be like, yeah, okay, I'll project on that. And it's all powered by Xbox Connect cameras. <laughs> that is also Most a likely. thing. That is also a thing. I mean, they're I... slightly fancier than Connect, but only slightly. Like they were the beginning and then it got fancier and fancier. No, I was only <laughs> half joking because I've seen so many people map 3D spaces with it like turn into... Uh, at Google, we have a wall that flip dots, you know, the, yeah, yeah. the, um, the wall uh, where the just black or white binary flip dots on a wall. And using several Kinect cameras, you walk by and your silhouette, you know, exactly. your outline is going by. They're it's, very it's powerful. Yeah. yeah. Like they're... I think that, that you two should get together and nerd out on the tech of this. <laughs> On your own. Uh, on somebody else's. <laughs> <laughs> There's no, also no, people no. that are way I mean, smarter is... detective than me. Like I. Because <laughs> like, you're yeah, the yeah, designer, what, right? What does the you come up with look like <laughs> <laughs> the idea. Yeah. Well, that was my question. Was once you you did Glass Menagerie and you were like, oh, yeah, this is what I want to do. I'm into this. Did it then? Because sometimes manifestation. It, we always say that manifestation is declaring that you want something and then changing how you show up in the world so that you create it. But in that phase, I'm wondering then, did you have to go seek it? Or was the theater industry there also and then they were coming to you? Did you have to go and say to people, hey, have you thought about doing it like this? Or <laughs> yeah. did they just find you? Yeah, I mean, then it was, so, so after that show and it was received quite well, um, again, I was in Greensboro, North Carolina. So there's, <laughs> there's, there's, a, yeah, there's a limited amount of theater available. Mm -hmm. um, and I was very broke at the time, so I didn't have the ability to like <laughs> bounce back and forth to other places to see shows, especially with projections. Like projection was still only vaguely existing to me. Like I started doing research into the history of it, um, like other software that could help me do it. I was teaching myself programs that would help me design, but like self doing. And then that is when they started um, the projection program at Yale. Uh, and I was like, I don't want to go the first year. I feel like I have, I've only done this one show and I don't know anything about anything. So then I spent the next year sort of exploring and trying and they had some more opportunities at the theater that I was at to design more. We did this insane Christmas Carol. 
hashtag all regional theaters. But like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we put it on and then I was like, oh, okay, I'm ready. And I applied and I uh, got accepted. I spent like my last $5 to go to New Haven wow. and apply and just to see how it, it went. more than $5. But, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think I spent it on the coffee before the interview. Like I, like I had like the hotel and the plane and then like the last five was the coffee. And, and, you know, banked it all. So, so then you've got this degree now from Yale in projection that is new and is great. So then, then what is the chance that connects you with Mark Jacobs and starting <laughs> Feast? You know, this I know I really design. want to talk about Feast. Yeah, that's yeah. So yeah. I'd love to. I'd love to. I hope it comes back very soon. So, I mean, okay, so then, you know, I graduated from Yale again with about $5 to my name. I moved to New York and just tried to meet as many people as I possibly could and tried to not be an asshole as often as possible to, you know, to try and be you know, as available as possible and work as much as possible on as many things as I could take in because I was just excited about it all. Because even though I had this wonderful education from Yale, there was still so much more to learn and to so absorb. Always, um, always more to learn. And it was my first time in New York City. So it was like, holy fuck, the whole everything is here. There's so many communities. What's going on? Let me meet all these people. And it just try to find my way and through the people that I met some opportunities came up but again it was just like trying to meet as many people as possible trying to be as kind and as available and as available as possible to mm. anybody anybody that would give me a chance so what I'm hearing is that just meet more people like and be nice don't don't be an asshole don't be an so asshole. that they want to they yeah. want to call on you <laughs> um be available is an interesting, I get it. It's an interesting concept of like, you got to say yes. You, to the dress. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. But I mean, where's the counterbalance to that? Would you, were you, was your approach like, well, I'll just say yes to every, I'll be available. I'll try all of these things and then we'll filter out. Or did you, or maybe it took a while to get to the point where you were a little picky yeah, so I mean, prioritize? yeah, I would say just now I, I have a somewhat ability to be picky. And especially in the beginning, because I had an artistic hunger and a, and a literal hunger, mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I had to make some <laughs> some choices. So I was like, you know, artistically hungry, but also hungry, hungry. Yeah. So I had to take work that could help pay the rent, you know, uh, try and set me up financially successfully you know i had some debt from both colleges as well as some credit card you know normal young person stuff and so that helped naturally weed out things like there was opportunities that would have been really exciting could i do it for 100 bucks or 200 bucks but i had to have work that could sustain me and i was lucky enough to have associate work and assistant work that i could at least continue to learn from now new mentors these designers on how the industry works we're going to take a quick break Stay tuned for more of the episode. And now we're back. Everything you're involved with, though, there's so many different uh, paths, genres, or maybe it's all the same. So, like Mark Jacobs, you're doing you're doing f work with fashion and work with TV and film and work with theater. Are these all the same connections on the back end, or is it just like now? all the connections that you were saying yes to years ago are coming to fruition. So you're just jumping from project to project that happens to be all in different mediums. I mean, I think it, it, it's all the same in the end, especially in content like, uh, like I create or artistic input it is more what I like to think of myself as like this dramaturgical, like this, this speaking and trying to understand what the idea or what you're going for. Um, but the people themselves that get me the gigs is, a, a wide gamut of people. I think it, it is all rooted in this theatrical or television space, but it is, you know, I think many people are trying to do many different things and take many different turns. And I think that's interesting. And so mm -hmm. any time that I can be with someone and talk about what they're trying to do and flex my artistic mind muscle or whatever, I think that's exciting. But like the, the gig of it really is just finding, finding, people that you're interested in being around and seeing what they're doing because just because it's fashion or a small like way downtown play like they can have the same way to feed you like the conversation mm. is just as exciting mm. 
even if it's completely different, even if it's corporate or, you know, completely artistic, like there, there is value, at least to me, in each of those avenues. Have you ever worked on anything or thought about doing some sort of fashion collaboration where like the models all come out dressed in all white or all some solid color and all that you see is projection all on the, their clothes? All the time. Sounds fantastic. I would love to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so why not? Uh, have you have you talked about this with with Mr. Jacobs or any? I have never met you? Mr. Jacobs. I met like a friend of a friend <laughs> that you know. You daydream we, and projection. Exactly, exactly. I mean, there there are always proposals happening. Like we're like I'm always trying to get involved in new and different things. Like you know, Feast is a great example. Like uh, this guy that brought me out, Roland Jones, that brought me out to LA also funded Feast, which is an immersive food show. Basically, I was like, why do I eat what I eat? I'm from the Midwest. My family mostly eats out. So wh why do people cook? Why, why does it matter what we eat? You know, I, I don't know. I don't understand food. I've watched, you know, Chef's Table, but that's, that's about the extent <laughs> of it. And so then we went to Ireland. I've met two other fellows that are interested in the same thing, a wonderful sound designer named uh, Tyler Kiefer and this wonderful director dramaturg named Hugh Farrell, who's Irish, that brought us out there with some of this dough. And then we just drove around the island and met producers of things and talked to them about why they farm and why they think it's important. And then we built it into this immersive show where it's a 12 course meal that you can see oh, the farms and the you know the oyster farms the the beehives you know how cheese is made and you hear from them in these special headphones that you can hear through so you can also talk to your neighbor if you want to so it's not a isolated experience and just experience you know how we're all connected and i mean hopefully that's what you get out of it how you're connected to these strangers at the table, but also how you're connected to the earth, you know, and why food is part of this. If you give to the earth, it'll give back idea. Wait, so where are the, are the projections? I want to go to there. I want to go to there too. <laughs> we're trying to, we're trying to constantly trying to make it again. <laughs> well, so, so how does, how does, I, I don't know much about this, about this. So is it like, I'm, I was initially picturing something like at Disney World where, you know, you, you step on the ground, like the kids step on bubbles and they pop, right? So yeah. is is it projection? Are you are the projections coming down from or I, are there projections? I'm making an assumption here, but what is the immersive I mean, nature of Feast? I mean, there's certainly video and we, we've been through many iterations with projectors, but it, I think it was important to us that it be as versatile as possible. Like we have this goal to like start in Maine where we are now and like drive across the country stopping at you know different farms and different places and having that feast every time at the farm in some capacity so you know it takes all the rigging and there's a lot of you know uh technical things that have to happen to have the projectors and the right lighting experience so I was like oh we should just have a theater and a table which is why there's no speakers it's why you wear headphones you know but it's all existent within the table itself, which is like this big 12 foot by four foot, like, you know, plinth stand table that people can sit around. And then as the surface, you know, there's a glass surface. And then below that, there's like five televisions that emit the video that we're talking about. But it's all existent within this little world that we've created that people sit around. Oh, so it's coming from under. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you look down at your food and yeah. can see the. And you see it. Yeah, oh, and you're so cool. and you're miming eating, and you pretend I'm I'm not. No, I'm yeah, kidding. there's there's like uh, fun no. games where it's like <laughs> shuffle it down, shuff, you know, like th we try and make it, you know, as silly at, and this, you know, because it can't all be like Earth, Earth, Earth all the time, which is valuable, yeah. but the you know humor and fun of it can't be lost. Oh, that's so much fun. Yeah, skeleton crew. I want to bring it back to that yeah. real quick. Sure. So you're you've been working with some amazing people. So like. Tony Award nominee Dominique Mariso, who also wrote Ain't Too Proud and starring Tony Award winner, five-time Emmy Award nominee Felicia Rashad. Like, holy crap, that's just Broadway royalty right there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Directed by Tony Award winner Ruben Santiago Hudson. So you, you've been brought into this, this cast. Alan creative loves to name drop. Team. Uh, Please, I'm, they're amazing hey, people. I'm glad they're yeah. amazing people. Like, <laughs> they are. <laughs> it's incredible this show and in. What was the what was the chance that got you involved with? Or what did you say yes to that got you into part of this amazing 
uh, opportunity to put on Skeleton Crew. I mean, it's funny that I, I feel like I keep talking about Rollin. I shouldn't. <laughs> so Rollin wrote this play that I did at the Atlantic Theater Company right out of grad school. It's like my first off-Broadway. It was my first real gig. And it was sort of about the Beatles. It was sort of Shakespeare. It was a delight. It was a hoot and a holler. And there was a ton of projections going all over London. And then at the opening night party, I was talking to, um, you know, the artist director and the director of the show, just sort of like, oh, what a blast. I would love, you know, any opportunity like you, like you one says in those moments. And I was genuinely like, they treated me so well. I was so young and they didn't, they didn't treat me like a kid. It was a delight. And they're like, well, actually we have this very small play in the downstairs, you know, and they just, they just wanted to add projections and talk to you about it. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, I don't know if you know the second stage at um, Atlantic uh, mm-hmm. Theater Company. It's mm-hmm. uh, maybe a hundred seats, probably less. Uh, and the set was already in, like it was fully done. It's, you know, similar to what you saw on Broadway, but there's no proscenium. It's much smaller. It's basically just the break room, but like we, and a wee break room. <laughs> <laughs> teeny tiny, teeny tiny. And I met with Ruben and he was just really excited about the idea of projections and bringing in this dancer. The wonderful Odessa was with us at that time as well. And we just put a projector in the house and I was like, yeah, let's do it. And then, you know, got critics pick and we decided to move it upstairs. Well, I didn't. Other people decided to move it upstairs at the <laughs> Atlantic and we did it there. And then it was like, OK, great. And then we just kept talking about it for years. And it, you know, had a great life, you know, all across America. And then, you know, Ruben got this opportunity to put it on at MTC and everyone said yes. So it happened in a crazy time. But it did happen. Manhattan Theater Club, yeah. MTC. Yeah. yeah, yeah. For for all the non-New Yorkers out there, <laughs> <laughs> and the the plot, 2008 Detroit, small automotive factory on the brink of foreclosure. There's a little bit uh, of personal overlap, too, right? Because like your your family, I guess. Well, what does it mean for you personally? Because your family sort of uh, came from that that. I was reading right that your family came yeah, yeah. from the, sort of that yeah, manufacturing yeah. background. And I sort of wanted to go back to what you were talking about, like. I actually think the doing other things before theater, especially, is good for the art. Like the most real world experience gives you the most in to what a lot of these plays are trying to, plays, musicals, artwork itself are trying to get into. And all of that helps. I mean, everybody has, a, you know, a, a robust and diverse background, but like the more input I felt like I could get, the more I felt like I could reach these specific works, especially, you know, a play that takes place in the Midwest. I'm not from Detroit. I'm from Indiana, but both grandfathers worked in a factory. My, you know, mom's side worked at, you know, Allison's for years on the line and then eventually became the manager. And so the, the play itself just really spoke to me and my upbringing and my, you know, the, the, you know, there are obvious differences, but like the, the root of the working class lifestyle was, really stuck out to me and helped me have this in and want to share through the video more than what happens inside that break room, which is a lot. But then when we went to these transitions, we wanted to expand out and celebrate the rich history of the city and the town and the Midwest and, you know, auto working as a whole and as like this union idea. How involved are you in that portion of the creative process? Like, with what people will see with projection. Do they just tell you, this is what we want from you, Nicholas? Or do you get to sit at the table and help dream it up? I, I've been very fortunate that I, I get to sit at the table. Um, I personally like working mostly on new plays because I like talking to the playwright and the director and helping create this world, like birth this thing into the world. Because I like thinking about, again, dramaturgically, like how the structure works and what we're trying to see that the actors aren't telling us or they are, or we want to emphasize this, but the actual literal visuals of it comes from me. Like the first time we did it in the basement, there was no, it wasn't in the play at all. It wasn't written in, Dominique hadn't written it at all in the play. And we just sat around and discussed it. We were like, oh, let's film this dancer and see, you know, Ruben had this vision you know, because he is the, you know, the point of the spear, like the, the vision leader. And then we just filmed him and tried to make this moment happen in different ways. But the the actual visual research, you know, 
I met with some photographers in Detroit that helped create uh, some of the imagery. You know, they had a rich catalog that they shared with us um, that we could find and celebrate Detroit. But the the art creative idea comes from the team as a collaboration. Yeah. So I saw Frozen. Okay, we talked about that. My, Let it go. Be, Let it be go. On, <laughs> you know what? I took my daughter and she loved it. So who cares? Um, <laughs> Beyond that, my real extent of experiencing projection is like the immersive Van Gogh production. Like, big, what are big, big. Here it is. Look, video, video, yeah. video. Yeah, and those Beautiful. things are big. And my partner just bought us tickets to the Prince Experience, which I am freaking excited about because I that am sounds, a big where Prince is fan. That? But that sounds fabulous. It's going to be here in Chicago, but I imagine it's touring. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that kind of projection experience and how that could or, or might inform more artistry in this way? I think there's room for all of it, honestly. Yeah. I mean, big immersive thing, it I mean, it's taking the the lead in an exciting way. Like it's pushing the technology forward. It, it, it's celebrating these artists, but it is like the face of it. Um, like Frozen, like you talked about, it is the face of the design. It is, it is yeah. uh, a little more than, you know, could be <laughs> upstaging, but maybe in a good way. Like, like maybe that's what they want, which is, which is, there's plenty of room for that. And I do think it's good, again, for the craft and people's awareness of it and the value of it. I mean, we can get into, you know, equal share, all of that design. But like, besides all of that, it's just good for the art. But what I think I'm more interested in is pushing other things forward. I, uh, I mean, I've certainly done scenic projections several times in my life. Scenic meaning like 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 the ice in Frozen, like like a scenic idea that is more right. of a literal, you know, magic. Let's say I think I'm most invested in, especially with new plays, is really trying to push this story or these people or this emotional thing that you might be getting but you can't quite feel yet forward. And I think that can manifest in many different ways. It can manifest in a car on a proscenium, like in, in like in Skeleton Crew, or like the the factory coming alive, like a human in the transitions, or it can just be a color moving abstractly, like whatever it is to help, you know, make these stories more intertwined mm. in the world more real. I mean, because I think that's what makes it different than film or podcasts or paintings like it, it, you know we have this palette in front of us that's live and so we don't have to abide by the rules of film where it's all 2d it's just flat like a painting it's flat i mean you can make it look very deep but we are actually in three-dimensional space giving you something with real people so we don't have to just show what is real it can be more abstract it can be more ethereal it can be whatever you want it to be that's helping push that idea forward as long as it's cohesive and thought through and all those things that people do that's so How cool to you watch ever... you talk about it yeah we, Alan and i both just kind of sat back and got a big grin on our face because it's really fun to watch people talk about things they have passion for i think yeah i mean it, it's cool when it works <laughs> 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 do you do you go to places like uh like I go back to Disney World, right? And I think about the projections now that they are doing on on the castle, on Cinderella's castle. Yeah, and that's a whole new level. I mean, I, I marvel again. I'm going back to the tech. So close your ears, Heather. Um, <laughs> the, the tech of keeping all the projections ex exactly on the castle to make sure you're not projecting off into the ether, or maybe it doesn't matter. I don't know. But when you see when you see things like this, is is that is that something that you take with you to your next project where you're like, oh, the Avatar land and they're doing projections here. I'm going to use that in Skeleton Crew or the projections on Cinderella's Castle. I'm going to use that on Mark Jacobs design runway thing. Like, how are you going out in the world and absorbing all of this tech and all of these things around you and integrating that into your work now? I mean, I think it all goes into the Rolodex. Like, you know, like it all gets filed away in different things. Like, just like a painting can then be mm -hmm. in there. You know, I have a very strange brain that what sticks and what doesn't stick is is wild. I can usually remember visual things, but not necessarily where the fuck they came from or who did it or whatever. So, <laughs> so, so there's always like a journey of trying to get back to that image that's in my head, which is great because then it's like a research path. I have all this stuff that the breadcrumbs I left or didn't leave for myself. Um, but like the 
the big things, sure. I mean, the tech, the tech is exciting, um, but I typically rely on a team of people to help me create that based off what the project's needs are. Like Skeleton Crew, for instance, the you know proceeding was pretty straightforward, but we were really excited about projecting on the glass windows upstage. But we also wanted them to be transparent, and so mm. I worked with you know the scenic designer, the scenic painter, you know my team to help figure out exactly the right amount of crap and what that crap is to put on the windows to make it transparent that we can see through as people are trying to come in, but also get a vivid image and to wow. transform the world. That's intense. Yeah. And that it, is. That's a lot of pieces working together. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it worked. And sometimes it doesn't. And then it's the exciting part of tech of like, well, fuck, what are we going to do now? What can we put on it? Like, what if I just mush this on there? Does that work? Do you get enough information that way? Like, I like that it, it, it's malleable. Like, it, you know, you can try and try and take a chance and just see what works. I love that you just said that because we talk a lot about failure on this show and how failure informs us and helps us. And I'm laughing, hearing you for, foretell that story, not foretell, hearing you tell that for, story. Foretell. Here <laughs> <laughs> Henceforth um, be known as the, story. The image in my head is, is kind of like, well, fuck it, let's just see what happens. And just yesterday, my 12 year old daughter, they're, they're about to do a camp play that they, you know, with a summer camp that they go to every year. And I love it. She goes, oh, I never read the script in advance. I just fail until I get it right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which I was like the proudest parent ever. I was like, this is my best parenting moment. And and when you said that, it felt a little like that. And I'm wondering if it actually is. Like, w- let's just get in there and monkey around until it works. Or do you need to figure out what you think will work and then see what happens? Yeah, I mean, I think the dream is that we do. We just get in there and mush the spaghetti around until it's a shape that we like. I mean, I think... At a certain level, producers <laughs> get <metaphor>. very, <laughs> yeah. At a, at a certain level, like producers no. get a little like uh, itchy about that sort of um, risk. So there, but there is, you know, we have, de- we have, ideally, creatively, that would be how you would prefer to create. That's how I prefer. I mean, the technical stuff yeah. needs to, you know, there's shops involved. There's all these things that are are involved. You know, wonderful shops that help you figure out the technical stuff too. Like that, as long as that toolkit is there then the canvas is open for us to play which is why i like projection so much because we can you know plan as much as we want carve your block like if you have a block you carve it off you can't get that piece back as the creative idea like if we can keep that block as clean as possible until we get to tech then we have plenty of opportunity to play as long as the tools exist for the canvas to be ready to be painted that was a lot of metaphors jammed in there, but I hope it came <laughs> through. <clear. laughs> All right, one more quick break. Hang on a second. All right, here's the rest of the episode. How easy is it to change, like to, to change projections, to update animations for for that matter? Because some of the stuff takes. I mean, you're talking about like render time alone. Yeah. Sometimes it can take days, or or I remember. I mean, the technology's come a long way, but I remember the first Transformers movie, the only good one. Um, that scene with all the Transformers in the alleyway with Megan Fox and Shia LaBeouf. I remember reading that every frame took like a full day to render with all the reflections and everything that had to be calculated. So when you're doing something ultra complicated, what I guess how how are you prioritizing the speed and what needs to be changed and and all of this stuff to paint the the final picture? Because it's not as easy. I I assume it's not as easy as just like, we're going to cut that song and write a new one. Because animation, especially when it takes physical time, literal time to compute, design, and render, I, how does that all work together? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends. Like, like all things, like sometimes you can just sort of make it up on the fly. Like technology has advanced that rendering can be quite short, especially for the scale to some extent. Like they're, they're obviously like doing, again, going back to Frozen, like I know that animation took a tremendous amount of time and they had to plan it pretty precisely in advance and know how long, you know, there was a lot of pre that happened. Like a lot of large Broadway musicals sort of plan as much as they can out beforehand because of the render time or how long it takes to program all the lighting to go along with the projections. Mm-hmm. But if it's a new play, most of the time you can be like, eh, fuck it. 
<laughs> You'd be like, uh, yeah, no, I think it's this, and we've really planned this out. But what if, what if it was this? Then you talk to people about it, and you sort of say, oh yeah, okay, okay, we'll try that tomorrow. You know, we can move on. We don't have to sit here and wait as the yeah. fans go really loudly in the computer. We can, you know, know what we're going to do and come back to it later. Which is also good because then you know we have time to marinate and see what else we learned by going on. So it's it, it it's a balance. Like you know, I'm always eager to get to what's in my head faster, mm. so that we can see it and talk about it and adjust as we need to based on the conversations in the room. You know, from everybody. And the longer it takes for me to get it out, the longer the, that it will take to get to what the best thing for that moment is. So that's why it's like we spend all the fucking money in the world on computers. Like it, it's insane, mm -hmm. the computers that we have to just try and make this happen as quickly as possible. But sometimes it is. Sometimes it's like, oh, we can't, you know, this is the final preview. This is our last rehearsal. We can make this change, but you won't ever see it. We won't ever get to touch it again. <laughs> so do we just slam it in there and see how it goes? And a lot of times it's like, mm. sure. Or a lot of times it's like, oh, no, like if, like if, the act, if there are more departments involved, then the answer uh -huh. is typically like, no, I don't think we can because that would mess up the actors. The lighting is going to be off and you know, the sound mm -hmm. has to adjust. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it is a, a, a negotiation on what is best for that moment. And cohesion is usually better than like one thing going towards another idea, even if that like might that. be the direction. If you had more time, like the the togetherness of it is a better idea than oh this is what we could have done yeah it's a giant ship that's already yeah. been set that's already been set in the water you yeah. can't just yeah, yeah. like change half of it without the other half going with it yeah <laughs> exactly it's true even though so, sometimes it's like no 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 let's really do it let's really do it. and then it's like actually no this is we should just, just this is just good doesn't work. this is good yeah. yeah you do so many things you have passion to bring your artistry to so many different things. I'm curious, maybe outside of theatrical projection work, what are the ideal scenarios for you to be your most creative self? Like, w what do you have to put together so that you can really dive into whatever your other interests and passions are? I mean, it, I mean, I hate to keep it, but it is, it's the people. It's the people. Yeah. yeah. Like who, like if it's in a, commercial space, who the client is, making sure that they understand what we're trying to do. Like it, it, we have a common goal, uh, which is for both of us and what process we want to go about doing that. And then who I have with me helping me and who they have with them helping them mm -hmm. and trying to plan out a structure that allows breathing room for us but also ample room for conversation where anybody can be uh, wrong is not the right word, but where you can say whatever. And then having the ability yeah. to know who's going to say, okay, let's do this. Is it me? Is it them? Is it someone else? Like who is that person that's going to say, let's move on. So do you not prefer, are there any scenarios where you where you're the driving force, you're the idea, you bring the table together. Um, you're like, I have this idea, I want to take action on it. Or do you prefer just to be brought in? No, I, I, I want to be as involved to the final step as much as possible, uh, especially when it comes to visual things. Like usually there's a larger goal, like we're trying, like in the podcast space, like, oh, we're trying to sell this coffee. We're trying to sell this cocktail club that we're doing now. Like the cocktail club was my idea from the beginning. And so I've been the oh, cool. the leader on it visually and, you know, producerially, which is very exciting to me. It, it, it's um, enriching and it's like artistically satisfying, but I still work with the hosts the of the team. podcast and yeah. my team that helps me put it on. Like we, there's, you know, pr liquor producers involved, distillers, you know, we have a liquor store in Brooklyn that helps us, you know, make all these things happen. But the the lead is sort of between me and the hosts of the podcast. I mean, I again, I like teams. Yeah. So me just being like the boss boss is fine, which happens quite a bit in theater, like the director and playwright are involved. But what the actual visuals look like falls falls on me. Um, but I like the conversation of it as much as possible to try and create the best thing. I like that a lot. In, yeah. Was there ever a time when 
you you thought like this is a failure I cannot recover from. There is something that this is this is so bad. I don't know how I'm going to change it. And then looking back on it, you're like, without that, I wouldn't be where I am today in this great position. I mean, on the small scale, every first preview, I'm like, <laughs> uh, I really fucked it this time. <laughs> this is all terrible. How are we going to change it all by opening? Wow, I can't believe people are watching this. Okay, we're, we're going to fix it tomorrow. And then I have like a million notes. And then it's like, you know, three or four previews later, we've made some minor adjustments. So I'm like, oh, okay, okay. No, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> uh, but on a large scale, yeah, I mean, when the pandemic happened, I was like, wow, I've invested my entire life into this live thing. And what is it going to be now? I work all the time. I, I'm never home. Um, you know, I travel. 270 days a year for different gigs, which is fun. Wow. I mean, I love to travel, um, but it was like a moment of like, oh, did I fuck up in doing this? Should I be thinking more about the longevity of, of how sustainable that is? And there are plenty of people that have sustained it for a very long time and love it. But looking at my own individual self, I was like, oh, should I have made different choices? And then we moved to LA <laughs> and then yeah. theater came back. I mean, and I learned a tremendous amount and continued to learn a tremendous amount from that side of LA because it gave more perspective to how the, another industry that it has its own positives and negatives. Um, and, and for many reasons is way more complex than, than theater helped me realize that, oh no, I, I like theater and this is okay. I don't have to do every single show anymore. I, I can pick and choose. I can, you know, try and make time to come like here, like come up to Maine and just like look at the water for a little bit. Cause that helped <laughs> me be a better artist anyway. Yeah. But it took like a step back um, to think about it because I consider myself a pretty, like I like to take risks. Like I feel like if you don't take risks, you get, yeah. You know, you can get stuck. I mean, there's obviously an extreme to that that is probably not always helpful. But like, I try to not be scared of failure uh, and calculating my decisions on where to go in my life and career. Yeah, that's that's the bit. You have to take the risks. You have to be willing to take the risks or there's no reward. That's just the way it works. Uh, Nicholas, what? Can you give us a sneak peek of the what the next big risk you're going to take is? I mean, I sort of hinted on it earlier, but the next big risk is trying to create this network. Yeah, um, okay. I mean, there's lots of theatrical risks that are coming up. I know but... a guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, his name's Alan. Yes. <laughs> oh, I am. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I want, I want to take it to the next level. Like, I want to create a space and a space for communities to exist that is different than what is currently available in a lot of these big box OTTs, as we call them, like over the top. So like Netflix or Apple mm -hmm. TV or HBO mm -hmm. Max, like non-network, non-cable box things. I'm trying to create one that is more about the community, that has a social media, hopefully a healthier social media aspect to it that creates uh, niche content for a specific clientele that can be varying in many different genres, but like a, a space for people to find a community that may not be near yeah. them. Sort of what the original idea of social media was, but based around these pieces of media. Yeah. A community is so important. It, Amen. it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's the key. This has been so much fun. How can folks find you and follow you and keep up to speed on all the cool things you're doing? Yeah. I really only do the Instagram, the which Instagram. is <laughs> the Instagrams. Uh, <laughs> and you can find me at, at Nick Hussong. Um, and I have a website that's uh, nicholashussong.com or nickhussong.com. I update it far too infrequently, but, but trying <laughs> to do it more now. And I work for Twice Street Book Club. They have a website too. You can follow them and see what we're doing there. 
Awesome. Thank you. I want to nerd out so much more on the tech. But <laughs> yeah, the I know. We'll save that for a different <laughs> podcast. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the tech and projections of the podcast, the network, the coffee. Yeah. I can see it now. I can see uh, it now. The collaboration, the community. Awesome. I'm excited to see everything that you that you produce and bring out. I love your passion and your energy and just really grateful that you chose to be here with us today. Oh, thanks, my God. Nick, thanks right? for having me. It was a blast. Was it, in fact, more fun than other podcasts? It was the, it was the most fun. <laughs> I'll say it right I now. I believe you, but I'll take it. <laughs> I just think that was really fascinating. I love to see and hear about the behind the scenes. Projection work fascinates me because sometimes I don't even recognize it's happening. No, like, oh, that's what makes it good. I know. And so the brain behind that is so so cool. And I kept trying <laughs> to get Nicholas to talk about his own like creative flow. And sounds like, like he just needs that crew. He needs that whole group of people. And and I think there are probably a lot of people out there like that who feel like maybe I think I think Nicholas is advanced, but who feel like they should be able to come up with it on their own. But it's okay if you need a community to get you mm-hmm. where you vision. Well, that's what we talk about all the time. And and to me, manifesting success is creating the team to mm-hmm. help you do more and be bigger. You can't do things on your own. And you got to have a team. you got to have somebody or a group of people watching your back. And people accepting these awards and being nominated for awards and whatnot, they all, everyone thanks their team. You yeah, cannot get where you are without a team. That's right. Or support structure of one form or another, whether it's your family or work or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. That's really, really cool. Um, Y'all, I can't go see Skeleton Crew because the show's closed, but I really want to. Yeah. It closed back in (laughs) Febs. It it finished its run. It it closed on as as expected. I really think that Nicholas was fun. You guys can't see, couldn't see his face. Uh, Hopefully you can hear it. I'm sure that you can. But he was just so invested in, in what he was sharing and so passionate about the work. And to me, that's just, it's so cool to see the behind the scenes on that. You like seeing behinds. I get it. Hey, it's cool. hey, hey. Inappropriate. What? Well, someone's got to say it. No. Everyone was thinking it. No, they weren't. Just you. It was just DM you. DM me if you were thinking it too. <laughs> well, where can they DM us then, Alan? Let's just go ahead and go there. Was it chance at Iggs? On the Instagram, <laughs> was it chance? <laughs> you know, I'm going to say it every time. Was, was it, it chance, chance at eggs? At eggs. On was Instagram. it chance? Was it? Yeah, was it chance on Instagram? And was it chance podcast at gmail.com if you want to slip into our inboxes, wink, wink, and let us know <laughs> what you're thinking. Let us know if you were thinking it too. You yeah. know what I'm saying? And how, what, you know, what chances are you taking? All right, what risks are you taking? How's it paying off? Tell us your stories. We're collecting them. We're going to do something fun with them one day. And we'd love to include yours. So We're going to be down at Podcast Movement in Dallas pretty soon. We are. Together. We should do Together. something live-ish. Yeah. yeah, if you're going to be there feeling. too, let us know. Let's meet up. Grab a din. Grab a, grab a drink. Grab a, a lunch. Grab yeah. a breakfast. Grab a coffee. Okay. Grab a... Is there Bojangles in Dallas? It's probably not, but I need Bojangles. I don't Bojangles. think so. Uh, yeah. Uh, I kept you from your Bojangles last year. I didn't mean to. Worth it. An accident. Aw, thanks. Worth it. Yay. Was it chance? <laughs> <laughs> it was definitely chance. Look, I made a calculated risk to not go to Bojangles and wow. instead go to dinner with you and the rest of the crew and look where we are. That's Riding so high. Thanks, ride or die. Man. You're my ride or die crew now. I love it. Anytime, man. <laughs> I'm here for it. All right, right. folks, you have been listening to Was It Chance, the podcast about embracing opportunity and taking intentional risk for your creative life. Thanks for being here. I'm Heather Vickery. And I'm Alan Seals. We'll talk to you soon. Okay, bye-bye. Bye.